LF fairies are right off camera here to welcome you to a happy Wooly Wednesday. Today we have a fun little place to go in our virtual vacay. We're going to go to Hobbiton in New Zealand and Needlefelt, a cute little Hobbit house. Now, for years we have had a free Hobbit house download. This one is a little bit different and we've never done it on video, so we're going to have some fun little tips for you today on getting some suggestions of details in a pretty easy fashion. So I hope you'll join us for that. You'll want to grab the download. The link is in the description and you can get the PDF along with the images and the supply list. So thank you guys so much for being here. And if this is your first show, say hi and it's your first show. You'll see lots of people over there in the chat window saying hi and where they're from. We're so grateful that you guys are here. This is an interactive hour, so join in the conversation ask questions, give some tips. I want to say hey to Karen Long, Jan Smith, Barb, Kevin Nobles, Kathy Falds, Norma Medina. Hey guys, thank you so much for being here, everybody. So this is Wooly Wednesday. It's an interactive hour. We like to do tutorials whenever we can. And for today's show, the fairies want to say hi as well and share some things with you that they think speak to them for today. So who's up first is Fairy Becca. Say yay! <laughs> Hi guys, Fairy Becca here. So today you're taking a trip to the Shire, but I wanted to make a quick detour to Flavortown. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a patch I made of Guy Fieri. He is the host of Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives on the Food Network. So I made this not only because he's a personal hero of mine, but as a thank you to his efforts to help support the restaurant industry during these tough times. So he's raised about 20 million dollars so far wow. and I think that's Dino Mike. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. Up next is Hannah. <laughs> hey everybody, how are y'all doing today? Very Hannah here just showing you um, it's one of our many options for backgrounds for needle felting or wet felting projects. This right here is going to be our PFX pre-felt. So as you can see, it's a pretty lofty pre-felt, pretty thick. You are able to take it though and split the thickness for certain kind of felted projects. Um, so as I said earlier, it's great for needle felting or wet felting. This size right here is going to be a 20 by 20. Usually it can be a little bit over 20 inches, never under though. So we have a 20 by 20, 20 by 40, and a 40 by 40. So that's our PFX pre-felt. Oh, they love it. Thank yeah. So much, Next up we got Miss Fairy Ann. Thank y'all. Hi friends. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. We pulled together some of our favorite greens in our MC1 batting. The MC1 batting is a medium fine fiber, about 25 microns, and it's short and crimpy and processed into a really even smooth bat. Marie's going to show you how to work with it later. You're going to love it if you don't already. But these are some of our favorite greens. Right here we have meadow, key lime, fern, parakeet, leaf, lemongrass, bamboo, true olive, sage, shire, of course we had to show you shire today, right? <laughs> Bonsai, and spruce. And one thing that we wanted to share with y'all especially today is the leaf and the fern. We get a lot of phone calls asking about a, a Cali green or a Christmas green. And these two are both great options. If you're wanting something uh, a little bit brighter, the fern is a great choice. And the leaf is a little bit more muted. Mm -hmm. Oh, everyone's loving the greens. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they're voting for their favorite greens. Right? Oh, perfect. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Lovely. Next up, we have Fairy Lauren. Hey y'all, happy Wooly Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining us. So today, if you're more inclined to wet felt or nuno felt, we would like to introduce you to this um, 
Emerald Forest Specialty Designer Pack. Not only is it absolutely gorgeous, look at all these beautiful colors, but it includes some MC1 for you, it has some merino top, and my personal favorite part of this is all the embellishments you get in this pack. Um, Angelina is my favorite because it's sparkly and gorgeous. And these embellishments can be used for um, adding texture and for um, giving your felting piece more texture and more definition. So highly recommend it. It's absolutely gorgeous and it's one of my favorite pieces here today. Um, up next, we have Fairy Kayla. <laughs> <laughs> oh, everyone loves that. Hi, everybody. I'm sure you've been eyeing these, this beautiful basket right here. <laughs> This is our enchanted forest locks that we've got here. And I've been having so much fun learning the living felt. Oop, they're gonna just, they're jumping off the shelf. <laughs> been having so much fun learning how to, how to dye locks here and wash locks, the, the signature living felt way. And it's just been so much fun and I wanted to share that with you today. These are premium Wensleydale locks. They're kind of varied between a nice brown, <laughs> to an emerald, almost like a spruce. They're wonderful for wet felting and needle felting as well. They are a little bit longer, um, so they're about four to seven inches long, so they're, they're great little fun, fun bunches here. <laughs> and it's so funny that we're doing a Hobbit house today because I had a dream last night that I wrote the Lord of the Rings trilogy and The Hobbit. I guess you could say I was Tolkien in my sleep. <laughs> and I, was so <laughs> I can't believe they've made so many movies and books. They've really been dragging it out. <laughs> All right, I'll leave these right here and I'll let you do your thing. <laughs> applause for the fairies. These are the gals that answer the phone when you call. They answer your emails and they fill your orders with love and goodness every day. We call them the fairies because they are truly, truly magical. And thank you all for playing with us and thank you for just being here. Um, so we shared some really fun things. Now I mentioned today is an interactive hour. We are going to be needle felting just a cute little hobbit house and we'll go on a little walk through the Shire. Uh, every show we like to give away prizes at the end of the show, but now we give away prizes at the beginning from last week. So if you are watching the live show, you can chat over here in the chat window. After the show, you can leave a comment or a question down below in the comment boxes below. And it is from those comments that we draw names for prizes as well. So our prize winners from last week's show are Kathy Connolly and Melissa Grayson. Congratulations, ladies. You can email customer service or use the contact us page. You can choose your very own studio pack from our MC1 fiber. And um, yeah, that's a prize we gave away. So stick around for prizes at the end of the show as well today. And if y'all are ready to needle felt, just say, hey, I'm ready. And thank you for being here. So the first thing you want to do is go ahead and grab that um, download that I shared with you. Um, and in the download, I'm going to list all of the supplies that I used and just some suggested colors. And if you've done this project or this type of project with us before, there's not going to be a lot of surprises there. But let's turn down here and um, give a quick look at everything you need to make this little hobbit house. So you'll want to grab the download, of course, make sure that you get that. And all of these things are on our website, um, just on livingfelt.com. Whenever you're looking for the PDF for the day's show, go to Living Felt and it's going to route you to our shopping cart. And then scroll to the bottom and click on YouTube videos. Under YouTube videos, there's a link for the year and then uh, the actual show. So grab the PDF and it'll list the supplies for you and then give you a couple of images and what and then the other supplies so what you're going to do is use an iron-on transfer pen to trace over this image you can use the reverse which was my choice uh, to do the reverse or the true picture so when you trace it it'll go upside down on your felt you're all familiar with that by now if you've watched our recent videos and here's what the little outline looks like for today's show this you just place onto your 100% wool felt 
I use the brown pen and you iron it from the back side to impress your lines. Now you don't have to do it this way. Um, we have under our learn section of our website an alternate way to do this and it's this Hobbit house that I made years ago right behind me. Uh, Y'all have probably seen this one. This is done on the PFX that Hannah just showed you. Uh, so it's a little bit thicker and I let the wool go all the way around and then wrapped it to the back side. Some of you will recognize this because we mounted this um, adhesive, not adhesive, but uh, reinforcement to the back. So this is done a little bit differently and maybe a little more beginner friendly or especially for the young ones is an option and that's we just cut out big shapes from our image and then use those as guides to needle felt our image. So this is another Hobbit house. I was noting today that my uh, this Hobbit house I also did very much storybook and not, um, I wasn't going for realism, I wanted it to be just playful and soft. And so this is our model for today. So you'll want to transfer your image and then get a collection of fibers. We're using our MC1 batting. These are my colors and this is often how I work is just with a little basket in my lap um, and just gathering like a little mixture of the colors that I want to use. So I'm going to be using a collection of greens, a couple of grays including storm for my pebbles and coal for some deep shadows, winter blue for the sky, a collection of browns, whatever you have, um, and whatever color you want to make your hobbit house. One thing about a project like this that I think is really fun is you can do even the same house and then you could change the color of the door or the wall or whatever you like over and over again. Um, so I hope that you all will play with that. Once you get your image transferred and we're going to jump a little bit ahead here because so many of you this is kind of you you already know what what we're doing but what I want to show you is how to get some of these details like with the stones and the flowers and the leaves a little more easy uh, it's just sort of a way to kind of get those textures without a whole bunch of effort um, and I will be watching for your questions and your comments as we felt together so I hope that you will send those in. Sorry for that clack. Um, cool. Okay. First pick, the, I like to first maybe pick the color of your hobbit house as opposed to the hill. And for this one, I'm just using a mango or mango can be blended with another color. And I'll zoom in just a little bit here so we can get a little more close. How's that? See if, see if that works for you. Um, and for those of you who don't know, and I will jump through this, MC1 batting is uh, US fiber, it's exclusive to us, and you get it in larger forms, or we sell it two, four, eight ounce, you know, larger, or you can get like little half ounce bits. And the felt, the wool itself is kind of lofty, and I wanna show you that you can peel it to really thin layers. I think I, I never showed that last week, but you can peel off little thin layers of this stuff so that you have just uh, you know like a paper thin layer oh sorry the face is still on there I knew something was bothering me a paper thin layer um, to work through so you can you don't have to put on the full thickness of the bat if you don't want and I just want to point that out but I'm gonna start with the Hobbit house and one thing you'll notice there's two ways to approach this we have these windows here that we're going to want to fill in and our door so one way to do this is you could just fill in this whole area with your wall color and go back and add the windows and the doors or you can snake around those spots or you can do a combination so if you just pull off the wool and make it just thick enough that you can't see through it then what you can do is just kind of get it in the spaces where you want it and we're going to use our 42 triangle to needle felt it flat so like I said for some of you this is real um, basic beginner and a lot of these you know felt alongs are they're just really the refinement of fundamentals and for many of you or if you're if 2d needle felting is new for you let us know that here in the chat box or down below 
Now I'm using a 42 triangle. I like it because it's fine and it doesn't leave great big needle marks. But you can also use a cluster of them, like this, to needle felt larger areas. Notice the stroke. I have different strokes for different types of needles and when I have a cluster of fine needles like this really what I'm trying to do is tack down the surface I'm not trying to drive it into the foam so you'll hear that the sound is different depending on how far the needle penetrates the foam pad underneath and you really don't need it to go too deeply Thank you all for your comments about the bats. Lovely to see you all here. Carol Clapshaw says, can you do this with a six-year-old? Carol, I like to say that it really depends on the child. I have uh, needle felted with six-year-olds with great success, but they are ones who can focus and pay attention and will respect the tools. I have needle felted with nine-year-olds that cannot focus and cannot pay attention and don't respect the tools. So I would say you really got to gauge the child and their development level and their ability to sit and really focus because when they poke themselves, it's really going to hurt and you want to avoid any kids who are like really reckless and, um, and I have seen them be really reckless because you don't want them to get hurt. That's the most important thing. So <clears throat> I want to just point out here that the, uh, this a little bit just about the approach. And one more thing is when you're trying to get fine lines or straight lines here, you can just scoot the wool where you want it and you know tuck it around, lay it down. But you can also fold wool back. So you can take wool over a line, further than the line like this, and needle felt on the line you can take even over a little bit further if you want and then fold it back inside just fold it back so that you get a nice crisp line so to start we're just going to color in the lines and i'm going to jump not too far ahead but to one that i started um, again last night and that is just we have our little hobbit area house filled in here and our sky just patched in here that's all we've done. Now, some of you asked about the clover punch tool last week, and I brought one, I thought. I brought one out. Uh, I will, oh, here it is. So this is the clover punch tool, and some of you might like to use this for larger areas. And this is the kind of environment where I would use that if you were going to. This um, has a little guard on it so that when it's locked, it doesn't move and you can't poke yourself. And then you just unlock it and the sheath, the sheath retracts as you needle felt. So if you're felting with young ones, sometimes it's nice to give them a tool like this. It's a little more safe and has a guard on it, but it won't help you do these really fine areas. Um, <clears throat> Lois asked, does it matter what color fabric you use? And my answer is no, because you don't want the fabric to show through. You want to fill this in 100% um, so that none of the fabric behind shows through. Okay, so I would say to fill in your, you know, your door and your um, sky, fill in your door and your sky, and let's get some interest going on in our little hill roof here. And what I encourage you to do is mix up some greens. Now we, um, well, there's a couple of ways to do it. So I'll do it one way for the hill and a different way for the bushes and stuff. Um, Get yourself just a collection of greens. They don't all have to be the same. It helps maybe sometime to even introduce a little bit of brown in there where you might have some dirt showing. You could maybe even have a little bit of yellow like um, mango in there. I'm going to put even just a little bit of brown in there. I'm just going to start to make a pile of a few different types of greens. I'll even bring a little bit of bright stuff in there. And now I'm just going to make a and not a very even blend, not very even. Okay, Jane that asked about the sky color. This is winter blue, and it doesn't look quite, now this is more of a blue azul with just a little white added, but this is winter blue. Now all I'm doing is, is just mixing this all up. 
so that when we lay it down, it's going to have lights and darks all on its own. And then you can go back and enhance any area that you like. But this is going to give it a little more just interest right away than filling it in with a solid color, which you can do as well. You can just start with a solid color. Uh, Gro asks, how do I decide on color and color mix? Gosh, Gro, I guess the, you know, the best answer that, that is that that is completely subjective. Um, and I'm just usually looking for one, I like to just blend stuff, and then I just look at the pictures that are in front of me and ask myself, what colors do I see in there? Um, if you're doing animal portraits, or like, not animal portraits per se, but animal coats with hair and stuff, you might watch, uh, we had a blending video, um, I don't know where it is, but I would look under the needle felting, we had a blending video, and we mixed up a lot of colors and we talked about seeing the tonality in those coats. Now already just by doing that you can see that I have something more interesting than if I just laid down a green hill. There's just something happening. And I should mention that some people would like to make their picture a little more fluffy or have dimension and you certainly could do that just by mounding more of this on. I wouldn't leave it fluffy, I would needle felt it flat. And so to keep my architecture, I'm going to start just by needle felting right here along this line. But I want to tell you, let me zoom in, it's okay to have some of this sticking over the top of the brown because this is grass and stuff and it doesn't all need to be exactly even. But this is kind of a quick way to get your hill in place. And for those people who are super tidy and you see I've gone outside my lines, what that's going to do is allow me to, um, when I do mat it, make sure that I don't have any bare spots right along that mat. Like right there, I want to make sure I don't leave that bare. So I like to go a little beyond where the mat will be. And I don't know if that's too close. I'll try right there. Y'all tell me, um, right, I'm going to start from this point, whether you would like us to be a little more zoomed in or a little more zoomed out. Um, I know you're on a mixture of um, devices, whether that's a tablet or a phone. But let us know what view you would prefer on this. Uh, let's see what else. Is that uh, on a green felt background? Marlene, yes, this is our 100% wool felt. And this is, I don't know what the name of the color is. Can you believe that? It's like a sea green to me. Maybe um, Fairy Anne is kind of uh, helping me out here. Maybe she can tell us what color green that is. So look, that's a real quick way to get an interesting little hilltop. Uh, into place is just by doing a premix and not overthinking it. So I used, um, again, I used spruce, I used bonsai, I even threw in a little fern, which is super bright. I used shire, and then I tossed in a little chestnut, a, pinches, a couple of pinches of mango, and something else. This is going to be uh, pecan. I just made a super quick mix of that. Now, if you want it really flat, Again, you can use your clover punch tool here and just pack it all down. This is really good for covering large areas, but it is really going to jam this into my foam. Or you can go a little more gradual and use your cluster tool. Okay, so I'm going to look for some of your questions and fill in um, the doorway here, and then we'll look at how we do this um, stone path next. So do y'all y'all want to be? Uh, oh, I'm seeing I'm seeing a mix of votes. A little more zoomed in and kind of where we are. Why don't I just meet us in the middle here, and see how this is? And when you want to see something really up close, let me know. But let me pause for a second, and I'll hold this right up. Now, one thing to keep in mind when you're doing these little pictures is your you are going to be very close and intimate with it while you're working but it's good to kind of step back from it a little bit because the viewer is really going to be sometimes often six feet away if this is up on a shelf or a wall um, wherever it is so say three to six feet away and usually we are right on top of it just scrutinizing every little bit so step back a little bit and see how lovely all those details look you know, when you get a little more removed from it. Um, 
Okay, y'all want to be a little more zoomed in, but seeing the reference photo, <laughs> I'm going to do my best here. I'll just tuck him under here and see if, if that is okay. All right, so I'm going to fill in my doorway. This is coal. It's not black. It is our darkest solid gray. We call it coal. Um, in MC1. So there are, there are other coals in our fiber families, but this again is our MC1 batting. And to fill in my door, I'm just going to make that little crescent moon there and tuck it right in there. Now, if you already um, work with MC1, we'd love to hear what you like using it for. I know some people wet felt with it, some people needle felt, some people do both, wet and needle felt with it. And we're going to be doing some more, um, some more different types of projects together as we go along. Uh, I have some interesting projects for us next week. So... If mixing in specialty fibers, would you blend in with felting in or put wool on top and then felt it? So that's a great question. And you know what? Let's put some in our bushes. Uh, she asked about blending in specialty fibers, and I will include some in the bushes here. I didn't include it in my original one, but we will. And by specialty fibers, these could be anything that usually, they're usually specialty fibers, or in this case, I think you mean what we call our luster fibers, and they are non-felting fibers that add some other texture or sheen to your piece. So it might be something like um, this right here is some Tessa silk, it's nice and shiny. This is some Sari silk waste, which is shiny and stringy. Um, or something, I assume that that's what you mean, is something like that. And so I like to blend it in before I needle felt, unless I'm applying it on its own. We'll look at that together. Now, when you get this big piece here and it's just too long, you can either tuck it back in, or if that feels too bulky, you can trim it off so that you don't have all that to deal with, and then just anchor this down here. The thing about these little hobbit houses is I think you can get away with doing most of the detail but not all of the detail if you're not going for realism. And I, on this one, I kind of feel like putting in a different color door. Uh, what do we think? Turquoise door or bright green door? I think we're going to have a lot of green. So maybe let's just make it a turquoise door. That's what I have. Uh, Melissa says, oh, let me uh, answer some questions here. Jennifer says uh, she uses MC1 for needle felting 2D and 3D. She got the Color Me Happy bundle, yes. So y'all don't know, that means she pretty much has every color of MC1 that we make. And she says she had all the options and now she's happy indeed. Sheree, who uh, is also very talented, says it's the magic of needle felting 3D and 2D. I'm so glad y'all like it. Paula, thank you so much. Um, and Melissa says, how do I choose where to start? Gosh, that's a good question. I, I usually start with, I guess, what's going to give me the overall tone of a piece. Like if I'm doing a doll, I start with the head and I'm going to do the eyes you know, the eyes and the face first, if I'm, you know, so I usually start with what's going to give me the tone of the piece, and in this case, it's the color, it's the color of the walls. Some people start back, you know, back to forward. Always, I'm going to do the most of the foreground last. Now, so I'm switching between 40 triangle and 42 triangle. These are two of our finest needles, and, um, that way we don't have to pick up our piece from the foam pad because we're not going to be jamming too much wool through the back side. Now when I'm working on a piece on my own at home, I'm going to needle felt fully and completely each little section of my picture. I usually don't keep it all in draft mode. I'm going to needle felt the wall completely, the door completely, and work my way out piece by piece. But one thing, I, a couple of the details I wanted to show you here that might be, I don't know, maybe something new or something to play with. So one, that's the premix of the fibers before you put them down for the hill. 
Um, number two is these windows. So we have windows that are nearish and far -er away, farther away. And I'm not, I'm not a trained artist at all. But one thing I noticed in looking at the uh, picture of this is that this one was reflecting the colors of the sky, whereas this one was just almost gray because of you know how they're positioned from the viewer. So that might be something to think about um, is just trying to hone in on that a little bit when you're doing when you're doing uh, when you're looking at the pieces that you're working on is how does that look so I'm gonna plunk down a little bit of blue here for my window and you could have gone around the window like we did with the door but if you didn't then just try and center it under this little archway if you do the same hobbit house now there's a lot of places so people always ask me every week i share where you can get uh, free pictures um, the free pictures you can get are generally i get when i do a free picture sometimes we buy the license for them is uh, Pixabay, P-I-X-A-B-A-Y, and Pexels, P-E-X-E-L-S. Those are two places where you can get free pictures. Sometimes if you see um, a photographer's picture, uh, they will. you can ask them whether you can do a piece of art from their work, and very often they'll say yes, especially if you show them your Facebook or your web page or whatever, and just get their permission. So all I've done is make a little circle, and honestly, it's not even absolutely perfect. But let's add just a little definition and trim it out. So I'm going to zoom in just a pinch here. And you'll want to take your MC1, just take a little tiny pinch. It's part of the magic of it. And then you'll do what we call drafting it out just into a real thin line. You don't have to roll it, you don't have to felt it or anything, but this is one of the places where you really want to use a fine needle because a needle that's too aggressive is going to push the wool in too far. And then what you do is you just anchor it down in one point and then guide it around your spot or you know whatever's your little shape you're making as you work and just draft it out as you work so that it gets nice and thin it's okay if it breaks off well then you just start over and do it again but trimming out this little window is going to make it look a little inset and you could also you know like I said you can build up your house so that it has a little more dimension to it I thought this would be a fun place to go how many of you have it on your bucket list to take a little trip to Hobbiton uh, and maybe if you've already been, tell us a little bit about it. If you're a fan of the trilogy or of The Hobbit, I'd love to hear about it. We, my husband and I are big fans of the trilogy. Um, we, we met in our mid-twenties and reading the trilogy was really something fun that we, we sort of did simultaneously. And one of the things that kind of tickled me about it was we would, we would be reading the books at the same time but I found that we had completely different ways of pronouncing like either a person's name or the name of a city or a town. And um, like one of us said, Osgiliath, that was probably me being a Texan, where he would say Osgiliath. <laughs> and the movie hadn't come out yet. It, there wasn't even a word of the movie coming out yet. And one of the games we used to play was we used to... Um, cast the movie so that was something we, we we thought that there really should be a movie about hobbits the hobbit and the trilogy and that was one of the games we used to play as young adults we just make it up and cast people um, so Alice Shoup says she's a huge Tolkien fan and what else do I see Jane Hall says is there a real Hobbiton well Jane this might be a good time so here's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna needle felt on my doorway just a little bit I don't have any music so I wonder if I could if I pull up music I'll probably just blow something so I don't have any music but let's go on a quick little uh, tour through the real Hobbiton which is the movie set um, from the trilogy, from the movies. And they built this sweet little set in New Zealand, and it's been kept now <clears throat> so that uh, it's always there. And you can go and book a tour 
and walk around Hobbiton, which I think is amazing. Look at the laundry hanging and all those little houses on the water. It's just brilliant, really. And you, some of the houses, I think you can like stand in the doorway. I don't think you can go in, but you can stand in the doorway. And um, I think there's also, uh, there's also some places where you can go to the Green Dragon Inn and I haven't been, but my friend uh, Charity has been, and that's on my list. Look at all those little houses. They're just amazing. And I wanted to share just a little walk. We can imagine that we're going to go have lunch at a friend's house, and definitely you would be eating some bread and cheese, even if you're a vegan. Well, goat cheese then. But <laughs> it looks like a day for bread and cheese and grapes and... I don't know, squash soup, butternut squash soup. Doesn't it seem like that? <laughs> and, and now we are back. So I wanted to take you on a, just a little journey through. I'm snaking some bricks around my little windows here to give them some definition. Um, and you can play with that, making it however you like. Um, this wool, I don't know. This, this piece that I have feels a little fuzzy. I'm wondering if it's something else. Okay, I want to read. Oh, Jane Hall says, where is it? So it's in Matama. I don't know how to say it. Matama, New Zealand. Um, but you can look up uh, Hobbiton, H-O-B-B-I-T-O-N, tours. I understand they are actually resuming tours May 30th. So they're just kind of firing things back up there, which is, I'm sure, exciting for them. I'm sure they're really glad to be back to doing that. Um, okay, I love uh, everything you all are sharing. Thank you so much. Um, so Kathy says, could you wet felt this to flatten and then add embellishments? So I want to offer something. Uh, if I wanted to flatten this, if I wanted to flatten this, I would needle felt it flat. I wouldn't use the wet felting to flatten it, but unless you already have it like really well needle felted like needle felted and then what you want to do is smooth it out you could wet felt it topically to smooth it out but I wouldn't be rolling it and stuff because this wool will want to shrink and this will want to shrink maybe 10 percent if you threw it in the washing machine and the dryer so this is going to be very resistant to felting where the mc1 will want to shrink up on you so i would do a topical and by doing that i would just wet this with soap and water probably put my hand in a sandwich bag or use bubble wrap and then just rub the top or you could just needle felt it really flat and steam press it that is a way to go also so um, one thing on this little door here, and this brick looks really wide, um, not that it matters, right? But notice that here, here you can kind of see the inside, the inside of the door, which looks kind of cement, but on this side you can't. And that's just that perspective. If I were doing it freehand, I wouldn't catch that because I'm not trained. I haven't trained myself to be really good, you know, at being that kind of an observer. And so sometimes looking at pictures is a really helpful way to start to train your perspective. And tracing out the picture is a really helpful way to train your perspective because maybe you're like me and you don't see that. And maybe you're different and you see it really well. Some people just capture it with their eye really well and I'm not one of those people. For me, I, uh, I really have to slow down and pay attention to what I'm seeing. So thank you all for your commentary and your questions. I really appreciate it. Um, let's see. Let me see what else you have. How do we know how much wool we should prepare before we start the piece? I find it hard to gauge how much I need, especially when blending. That comes from Jessica. Jessica, I think it's a great question, but I'll be honest with you. I don't gauge it well. I'll say that this entire piece is not going to weigh more than probably three-tenths of an ounce of wool. Uh, maybe uh, maybe four tenths maybe a half ounce so maximum maybe a half ounce I think that's really pushing it so I usually do what you see here and that's grab bits like this and out of my bins and go back and fetch more so for a little picture like this um, just to give you an idea this piece right here this this right here is probably a quarter 
a quarter of an ounce. So it, you can see that a whole picture, it wouldn't hardly take that to fill it up. Um, so I, I don't know if that helps, but that's my, that's my contribution. Um, I used to take classes of children to Sarah Hole Mill where Token was inspired to write The Hobbit. Wow, Sue, that sounds really awesome. And now, Sue, you're in Devon, I think that's right. Um, if you want your picture not to look fuzzy, then needle felt everything down. And if it still looks fuzzy because of the type of wool you have, then you could get out your little scissors, but you could also steam press it. So check this out. Right here in this doorway, we're going to insert our little rim here, and that's going to add some, it's going to add just a little bit of dimension to our door and make it, bring it a little more to life. And again, we're just going to snake it around, and then I'm going to jump to the stone. So I'm bringing this gray in so that we can get over to our little stone bit. And this is kind of the inner rim, the inner rim of the door. It's interesting. It does look like they made them cement. Now, I think there's over 30. There's over 30 houses. There might be 40 houses there in Hobbiton, which is just amazing that they actually built all of those. Um, Oh, Joyce says she loves Lord of the Rings. Now, Joyce is with us. Some of you may have seen that dragon in the background uh, when we started the show. And if you stick around, I'm going to tell you a little something about that dragon when we get to the end. Because Joyce Hazelrig, who is a Texas girl here with me, she lives just down the road, is uh, teaching an online class on needle felting her amazing fantasy dragons. And um, I'm going to tell you a little more about that after we get done with our little hobbit house. Okay, so you can bring the gray up a little bit more up the door if you want to. I want to kind of jump ahead so we can get to the stone path. And I want to show you how easy it is to knock that out. So we have a little stone step here first. And part of what's going to make it look a little more like a step is just having a little gray line right underneath it. So I'm just going to put some wool down and make it generally the shape of a step. And then we'll add a little bit of gray, a dark gray, to delineate that step. Kat says, do you needle felt it totally flat or with some texture like on the roof and stones? Um, Kat, I'm a flat. I, I generally tend to go flat, but if you want it to have texture, that is totally your option. So if I'm going to put it behind glass, I don't want it to have texture. I want it to be flat. And what you're looking at now on my piece is not as flat as I make it. It needs to be more flat to suit uh, what I want to do, which is put it, I have these, I got myself some little uh, small frames so that we can frame out our, um, I could frame the little postcards that I've made with you this summer. And so, yeah, I'm going to frame mine. So if you don't want to put it behind glass, you know, leaving the texture in is definitely an option. And some people would build up that texture, and then some people would just mm, leave it loose, a little bit more loose. It's really up to you. Okay, so check it out. Let's make this stone path here. And notice that I didn't draw in all the stones. I just kind of outlined where that path is going to go. So firstly I'm using Storm, which I think is just the perfect gray for this uh, for it to look like a stone path. And then we'll start up here if you want and in the more narrow end of things and just anchor that down. It can go over where it's going to be. We're going to put grass over here and foliage, bushes, flowers over here. So it can extend a little beyond. Look, notice my needle is going at an angle. You don't always have to go straight down. You can go at an angle, tack these things down, and just get the whole stone path where it will be filled in with your gray. Sue Pruitt says, what would happen to your felted project like the one you're making if it were to get wet? Sue, if this got wet, like it got wet, like I spilled a glass of water on it, nothing would happen except it would be wet and then you could just set it out to dry. Nothing is going to happen if it gets wet. Think of like if you got your sweater wet or wool sweater wet, a pillow that is, you know, fabric wet or wool or your wool socks wet. I know those are woven items, but nonetheless, it's just going to get wet and then you can dry it out 
and you could even steam press it, you know, so that it's nice and flat and looks how you want it. So nothing will happen to it. Cindy Hall, if you're doing a larger picture that you want a wet felt personally, would you use Merino or MC1? Um, I think that's a great question, Cindy. We are going to do some bigger pictures together, and for me, one, it would depend on the picture, the type of picture I'm doing, and two, if I were doing this picture, then what I would do is I would put in base colors for the um, ground and even the sky and the basic background tones, I would wet felt those with merino top and then I would go back in and needle felt in my details with MC1. Usually that would be my preference. So there are many pictures that I would make that I would only use merino top. So I think it does depend on the type of picture. Uh, but if I were doing this, I would use merino top and MC1. And I've also wet felted an entire picture just, just MC1. Um, not just one, but I wet felt the entire pictures with just MC1. Okay, so now here's our stone path. Now we want it to look like this. So you're going to want to get your coal and your spruce. Don't just use gray. Use gray and green. And you can then even, oh, I didn't bring in olive. So I'll bring in, I'm just going to bring in a, just a pinch of, a pinch of shire, but I don't want it to be too light. But what I want is dark, grassy stuff to go in between my stones. So make yourself a little mixture. If you don't have a mixture, go for spruce or just the gray, but go for the darkest bit that you can if you don't have uh, one or the other. Black would be too black, I think. So use what you can to darken up what you have. Now, now that we have this in place, I'm gonna pull out the light bits. Now, even though I've made this little messy little bat, I'm gonna to start to just kind of tease it out. And let's start somewhere where it's kind of easy, which is like right here off the door. I'm gonna use a slight, the slightly more aggressive of the couple of needles that I brought. And I am going to, I'll just start right here. And now you can just trace out your stones and find your way. If this needle feels like it's not aggressive enough, meaning like it's not really anchoring it down while you needle felt, well then jump to a 38 triangle or a 38 um, star or something like that. So now just snake around, and I'm gonna work on these. Um, and you can make them big and you can make them small. You can always go back and add in more lines and try not to overthink it. And we're just gonna start to trace them out. Now, this is kind of sitting on top and you don't want it to. You want it to be underneath. So you can, if it feels too strong, you can plop just a little more of your storm right on top or whatever that gray is and hide some of those lines because they're not all gonna be incredibly present. They're going to be hidden uh, hidden under there where the whatever the growth is is a little bit lower so I'm going to just keep working these in and I will look for some of your comments and feel free to share your ideas too now if you're watching the replay you know do it down below and if you're not able to chat on the chat window or if I don't grab your question because a lot of comments are rolling by you can also leave it after the show in the comments there'll be a comment section down below after the live show and make some thin you know make some oddly thin and some little rounded pebble bits and that's gonna you know give it a little more realism if you don't make them all the same size let me see what else you guys are saying here how long does you how long does it take you amber asks amber lynn to needle felt it as flat as you would like it to be i would say that um Gosh, that's hard to say because I do each little section and this is going faster than I would normally go. So I would say that, you know, on a picture like this, you know, this, this making this picture is just a few hours and I'm, I'm happy with it. It really is. Maybe, I don't know, you could definitely do it in a little three hour, in a little three hour sitting. And some people would do it much faster <laughs> than I would, but I just like to ponder it as I work. Mm -hmm. And so maybe I'll kind of feel like the stones are the stones are coming alive here a little bit for you. 
without having to go in and put in every stone, you put in the lines. And I think when you're looking at your picture up close, the green is going to make a lot of sense um, as opposed to just having gray in your, in your pocket of colors. Uh, Linda says she likes this way to do the stones. I'm so glad. It definitely helped me because on my original picture, I just put in all of the stones and that they don't look, you know, they have the essence of stones, but it doesn't really feel like a little path. Let me see what else. Um, Sue says, if I start collecting MC1, what colors would be the most useful to start off with? Gosh, Sue, that's a really great um, question. So if you're just starting, it, you know, I might say it depends on what you like to make. I can tell you that by far our, um, the, the most popular color collections are our earth tones. And so maybe it's because that speaks to whether you're doing landscapes or animals, but the earth tones is the most popular family. And so I would start there, but then I would ask, what do you like to make? It really depends on what you like to make. Yeah. Okay. So I might have a little more stones on here than my other one, I'm going to go, as I get to bigger, I'm going to go just a little more green. I would put a little olive in here, and I see somehow I managed to walk in here without that being in my, my color basket today. So olive can keep this from being a little overly dark as you get to these um, bigger areas. And just take your stones, you know, as many divisions or you, as you want or don't want. But up here along this area, they get a little larger. It's almost like they're they go from little fill-in stones to those great big those great big steps that you make. So look at that. I particularly chose a picture that had a stone path that was real obvious just because I wanted to make that. And you might just you might pick a completely different Hobbit house, which would be fun. Or you might even like I say, you might do the same Hobbit house but in different colors. Oh, Thank you. Anne just came in with green. Thank you, Anne. She brought me olive. Olive, this is olive green. Olive will just kind of um, tone down this super dark green a little bit and add a little bit, add a little bit of interest, meaning, it, you know, not make it all too, too dark. Okay. So this, this takes a little time, but honestly, it's, it's fun in a really mindless sort of way. <laughs> so I hope that you have fun uh, making yours. And let's jump over. I'm going to jump off my path now, although I know I could noodle it forever. Um, I'm going to jump off my path, and let's do some of this foliage along the sides of our Hobbit house, because that's going to add a lot of interest. And I will come back to my path. It looks kind of messy because you can see all the periphery, but once we start to get our bushes in here, I think it'll make a lot of sense. So I'm gonna start over here, especially in this area. I'm gonna put some very dark green right underneath this edge of the hill, and then I'm gonna plunk down uh, some olive and dark green here. I really wanna fill that in so that it serves more of a backdrop to the foliage and the flowers we're gonna put in there. And let me hear how you're doing, how, how are you thinking about this? You know, one thing I, I do want to say for sure, and that is, you know, four of us would have four different approaches, and I think that would be really fun. So your ideas are always absolutely welcome and treasured. This is obviously just a fun time to hang together and play together and share together. And um, I love, what I love are some of the ideas that all of our friends bring to the group and the the variety of approaches that everyone brings. Oh, I need to, I'll finish my window later. <laughs> need to trim out my window there. Okay, so now the bushes and the plants, they can grow right up here to the face of your building. And we wanna tuck this right into the doorway here and fill in all of our, our little crevices. And this really serves as a backdrop to us putting in some flowers. So let's do the same thing on the other side, and I think it's going to help it really just kind of bring it together. This is where our, our picture is going to be filled in, uh, right to there, so we don't need to go too far off the map. 
Okay, I want to see what more of you are saying. And this one I'm going to mix up. I'm going to mix up the colors, just the backdrop, if you would, the backdrop of colors just a little bit. This is fern green, very bright. Mix it with Shire. might seem a little unexpected, but that's going to give me just a little more of lighter notes right up here at the top. And So y'all are talking about the stones. I see, and I know that I'm behind y'all. Y'all like that method. Uh, Kathy says not all round stones are odd shapes. Yes, I agree. Um, and oh, I'm glad y'all like that. Um, Let's see what else. Guess you can use the same techniques to make roof tiles. Oh yeah, grow. That would be good. Yeah, you can do the same for, for roof tiles for sure. So I have some bright green into here and then I'm going to go a little darker over here just for fun. Let's bring in bonsai because it's not solid. It's already got uh, a bit of a blend to it. And I'm going to mix in some of that olive that Ann brought me. A little more earthy green. And um, Jenny Trelor says that she tends to gravitate towards blues and greens ocean colors. Oh, she likes those for her projects. And um, Ka Angela says, do I ever embroider flowers on? You know, the truth is that I'm a very unskilled embroiderer, so I kind of get lost. But I will share a piece with you at the end uh, that somebody posted in our Facebook group. I'll share a couple of pictures from our Facebook group of someone who did some really cute ribbon embroidery on a piece. And um, yeah, so I say, you know, add your embellishments on however you like to. Okay, that's just a little a moshiness there, just a, a mishmash of colors. And that's totally fine because you can add detail on top and we're going to add in some flowers and such. You could also stitch. So yes, embroider specifically flowers or you could just add some stitches to your piece. And if mixed media is your bag or that interests you, um, I think you'll probably have fun with a project that I'm going to share next week. I'm going to do something completely different next week and jump off of our little uh, travel series that we've been doing a little bit um, and do something different. I'm going to plunk this guy in here. Okay, I promise we're going to get to flowers here in just one second. So, with flowers on either side or foliage on either side, you can do the same thing. I like to just grab um, some little bits to see what I'm feeling. And even I put some white uh, flowers in there, which I thought um, they, they kind of fun how they just popped out. But what you can do is... Um, just you could use neps or embellishment fibers or something else but you can also just grab little bits and I'm going to zoom in here um, and I wouldn't be overly specific about the shapes I would just put in some little dots of color and you can twirl them so they get kind of round but you don't need to fuss over the shapes you don't need to try and form really specific flowers because truly you wouldn't see them from this far away or you wouldn't be able to see all the individual petals so you can just put in some little specks of color now some people you know might want to use wool neps and I did bring a few here for this but you don't have to you can just grab little bits of whatever color you're feeling and if you put in a color and you don't like it well then you can just pull it right back out so uh, use your tweezers or you could even bury it all the way to the other side if you wanted um, so I'm going to try and make this a little bit balanced by putting flowers on either side in similar colors but not in a really orderly fashion and again remember that people are going to be viewing this very far back so it's not so important um, that the specifics are all in place. But I would be needle felting it all flat. Like when you see this piece up close here, you can see that it's very uh, rough. And I do like to get everything laying down. But you don't have to. You don't have to. This is your happy little hobbit house. It can be as ruffled as you want it to be. OK, let's see. Um, cannot wool felt fabric get wet or does it fall apart? Um, let me see if I can answer this question by Linda. It looks like another, I, th I think this is a buildup of the same question. Can wool felt fabric get wet or does it fall apart if you use it as a base? Um, 
For needle felting, this is wool felt fabric that I'm on right here. This is wool felt fabric. It will not fall apart if it gets wet, but it won't really shrink in the wet felting. So I think I might be missing your question, and this might be a good one to call us on so that we're sure we answer it correctly. You can telephone us, y'all. Um, we're, we're here um, Monday through Friday right now during COVID. We're not open on Saturdays, but you can call us. Uh, I'm going to tell you the phone number because I don't have a free hand to type. It's 877-665-5790. And myself or one of the fairies would be glad to answer your questions for free. We don't charge for that. Um, just give us a call and we will answer your questions, see if we can help you better understand what you're trying to do. Okay, so let's see. You get the idea here with the flowers, and then if you zoom out, then they're going to look just a little more interesting. So just step away from your piece, you know, give it a look here or there, and just keep adding flowers where you want to and give it the color that you like. So this is the quick method, and I see some questions popping up. Um, can you... Lee Davies says, can you blend or hand card merino top and MC1 bedding, or do they have to be the same texture? You can blend them together, but um, what you're going to see is that MC1, not only is it a different texture, but it's also a shorter fiber, and uh, the merino top is a longer length fiber. So there are going to be some challenges, and my best answer is to tell you to play with it, to, see, to try and achieve what you're trying to achieve. Now, we had asked some about blending in um, luster fibers or something like that. So let's look here. So this is an example of Tessa Silk. Someone asked, how can they tell the difference between Tessa Silk and bamboo? Um, I don't know how to tell you how to tell the difference. They're going to look very similar, but uh, bamboo is going to be shinier than Tessa Silk, and viscose is shinier than Tessa Silk. So something you can do here is like you could just take one of these wispies, and you could even cut it if you want. You could ball it up, and you could just needle felt it down here into your um, picture, just so maybe you get that color or you get a little bit of sheen. And that, like, that particular one is really going to pop. Uh, it's going to have like a little bit of sheen to it. Or you could mix it with something like MC1 if you wanted. And do, like in the bushes, you could do, and I'm not going to do that because it's not the same color. But you can see like this fiber is actually kind of a long staple length. So the length of the fiber is long compared to MC1 is very short. So similar to if you were mixing merino top and MC1 together, what's going to happen is this fiber wants to stay long and MC1 is short. So the only thing you can do is either tear this fiber um, or cut it, but you can actually break it so that they felt a little more together. And if you want to see more of that happening, we had what we called a fiber mishmash where we made a fall tree. We will link to that. And we not only made a fiber mishmash like this, but we cut chunks into it to make it more textured. And I considered that for today, but I decided not to because it tends to be a little more, um, a little more of a clumpy, a little more of a clumpy design than I wanted to do myself. Um, okay, so now you see basically how to do the stones, how to do the flowers, and I wanted to suggest that for the leaves up here, um, one of the things I did up here was very similar like we did for the stones, and that is just to get a suggestion of some leaves happening and some busyness, then um, I might not go to too solid of a green, but here's Shire, and I literally took uh, this and just went at all kinds of angles and looping angles back and forth and back and forth and I tore it off often so that I wasn't looping it around but looped these around to kind of create an activity over here that would suggest leaves without having to try and put in a whole bunch of leaves because <laughs> that would take forever. So you might play with that idea and all you're really doing is you're, it's like you're cutting up um, the green that you laid down but you just don't want to be too orderly about it and that's why I let it keep just tearing off because you want to just break up 
that big block of green and make it look like there's shadow and depth underneath it. It's less about tracing out leaves and more about adding a background. Because unlike, you know, when we watch Bob Ross all the time, he's got these magical textured paint brushes. He could lay down this dark green and then stipple or fan brush or whatever he uses on some texture on top and this is uh, you know wool is a little more challenging because we don't have all those textured paint brushes but this is kind of a workaround is to put down the light green and then cut it up so that when you're standing back it's gonna look a little more leafy if you will and let me know what y'all think of that um, <laughs> Lois says she likes the idea of a sheep on the roof or maybe a cat. Lois, I like that idea. Now, in truth, there's a great big tree back here somewhere, and it adds a lot of perspective. But on my little 4 by 6 I decided I wanted the house to be a little bit bigger. But I think that might have to be something I do, is put, put a little something on that house. Um, and I know we're, we're after three, so let me see what I can do. Now, without continuing, I would continue cutting this up over here with some little darks, some little darks and lights so that it's not, um, it doesn't just look like nothing is happening. It looks like there's some differentiation, you know, between the bushes. But again, just take your little frame so you decide how far are you going to go. Like, what else might you, might you put over here? You might just fill all of this in. Uh, with flowers, but let's look over here a little bit and see about adding some uh, detail this way as well. Let's see. I want to see what you all say. Um, can you needle felt sari silk waste or only wet felt? Oh, which reminds me. I brought some for you. I thought that would be fun for the grass. So where I had it in my hot little hands. What did I do with it? Sorry, I'm going to have to open this package. Oh, here it is. Okay, so now this is hand dyed by me. So the, the colors that we have are very solid, but you can buy white and you can hand dye your own. And I did bring some um, so that you could see about adding it. Now, sari silk waist is literally saris, or think of like the dress that Indian women wear um, that have been basically repurposed. So it's like upcycling. They have been, ble all the colors been bleached out and then they get shredded up but sometimes there's waste made in the making of saris. So sari silk waste can be both. It can be shredded up saris. It can be like you've seen sari silk ribbon maybe, or, or it could be the waste made from actually weaving the saris in the first place. So this might be a good place. It might feel like there's some little grass in here. Now, uh, silk by its nature um, is very resistant to the needle. And if you've ever dyed it, you'll, you notice that it's also kind of resistant to the water as well. But let's say we put it right here and we want to just add a little interest, like a little wiry grass or something right here. So think about how long you want it maybe you want it doubled over like that that seems cute that adds a nice little texture now this stuff doesn't really want to felt but what i would do is take a little mc1 batting and just put it right over the top so that you're like stapling it down but only along the bottom there right there is where i'm going to put it so i will needle felt this down and the mc1 will felt and it will just like be like little staples, little fiber staples, if you will. And doing something like this would be a really fun way to have a, a piece with a lot of texture. So you, you could have your little sheep sticking out. And I'm gonna needle flip this down a little bit so that it's just not all straight and boring and sticking straight up. If you scooch it a little bit, then it, it, it'll, it'll squiggle a little bit. So there's what that looks like, just a little my camera didn't like that just a little uh, wispy and playful down there so hopefully you like that let me see um, Susan I'm missing a conversation but I want to know what y'all are talking about Susan Cunningham says agree that it looks different after it's been set aside I often take a picture to get a better idea of my values and to see what areas need work um, Linda Repkin says it's like being an impressionist painter. <laughs> That's fun. Hey, y'all, you know, someone want to encourage you over here. 
don't be afraid sometimes to mix brown and green together. Like it doesn't have to always be green and green, blue and blue, or a gray with a color. You think about how often you see a hill and it, it might look some brown and some green. And you could even go a little darker if you want. Oh, here's some cinnamon. Let's put some cinnamon there and add a little bit of interest. So mixing these together really creates a very earthy color. And one thing I think MC1 offers, this batting that we're working with, is really a lot of earth energy. It really does have a lot of earthiness uh, in the color palette. Whoops. And I'm just trying to make a little layer here. And again, I'm always trying to do something that's not just uh, one dimensional. So, and then we just overlap things. So I'm going to tack that down and you can have your little grass, uh, sorry, you can have your little grass spot over here if that's of interest to you. This is a wheelbarrow. We won't have time to add that little detail in. Not that it takes long, I think, but sometimes you just tack things down initially. And uh, let's see. By the way, if you really wanted to get textured, these are the locks that Kayla showed you earlier, and I just literally nabbed one off the shelf. These are the Wensleydale locks that she shared. If you want to use locks, grab the natural tip. The natural tip is tapered, and then this is the cut end up here where we sheared off the sheep. Grab the natural tip, so grab the tip here to try and divide the locks and pull them towards the cut end as opposed to trying to pull from here. So you might decide to use something like this in your picture and really dress it up with some texture. So let me put my little frame on there and like if you want yours to really stick out that might be a fun way to add some texture to your piece especially if you like this flower in here, the Tessa Silk flower really kind of stands out from the other wool stuff, but that might be a fun way to add some texture in there. So let's put them in. This one won't go behind glass then. This one I'll let stick out. I love adding locks and it used to be that I always put in locks for texture and so I started forcing myself to find other ways to create texture, but locks are just a real fun way to add texture to a piece. And if you don't like all that green there, well, then you could just add another piece, another curl, just like that right there. Um, how 3D do you usually get in the process? Um, Mary asks, Mary, I don't tend to get all that 3D anymore. I tend to want to put something behind glass because it gets handled a lot or, you know, picked up a lot. Um, so I tend to kind of put things behind glass, but I think that is completely subjective and I think there should be no rules around it. Whatever you want to do is the right way to go. And I'm just going to put in a little hill over here. Let's drop in a tree because it's going to give some perspective. And I also found that just dropping in a few clouds in the sky made a, made a big difference too right there. How long, Karethi Hurst says, how long does it take to choose colors before you begin? Me, five minutes. If I'm doing a picture like this, five minutes I'm grabbing. But I have all the colors in my studio, uh, and if I don't, I just make do. Um, so for me, it's just minutes to grab the colors. I just I don't know, I, but I know our colors, so it might just be faster for me too, just to be fair. Um, is there a way when cutting the locks to make it look natural on the cut end? Oh, look, on the cut end, so when you're cutting locks, you're, you're not going to notice on the cut end. So what's natural, you know, this the cut end is where it's just been cut off the sheep, so it doesn't matter how you cut that. Just slice it across, no problem. If you want to cut this short, well, then just snip it. But before you cut it, and don't worry about that bit, um, it's not going to look, you can cut it at an angle, but it will never look like the natural taper. But you can also fold locks in on each other and use them, you know, use them in bulk like that rather than cut it. You can use more of the bulk if you want. So to make a tree, now I'm just going to get some trees in over here. Let me see again right where we are. We're right here, so I'm going to have to really sneak these trees in over here. They do add some dimension to the piece, and all I'm going to do is draft out this real thin trunk or two. Just draft a real thin line. You can always go back and add more trunk, like Bob would, you know. 
Bob's going to go back and add more trunks. So you can go ahead and put two in so that it feels like you have two trees. And now I'm going to ask you all a question. I have a new project, a completely different project and fun, I think, a little different style and mixed media all planned for next week. Or we could just like mount you know mount our greeting cards our postcards I think it's pretty easy and we do have a video that is on mounting your your fiber artwork different ways to frame and mount your fiber artwork um, so I but I don't want to leave y'all hanging after we've spent this time making multiple postcards together so a little bit of a vote there in the chat and down below would be good uh, now these trees I'm mostly gonna keep dark and what you can do is, I don't know which way you want your bows to go, bows, bows down or up, but we've made trees together before, and I'm just going to pull it off. And keep in mind that um, these trees are not very specific. You can't really see what they look like. So just get some branches in there. And in this case, they're usually going to be a little more rounded on the top and a little more flat on the bottom. So let me see if I can achieve that. I'm trying to talk and read. <laughs> but I would say don't worry about it too much. You can kind of fill it in a little bit with some clumps like that. Needle felt it down. See how you feel about it. Add more trunk. Take trunk away. I'm going to go a little darker. It's nice to have some area filled in and then some things show, uh, some blue sky to show through as well. Um, Jude says, this is a tutorial I would come back to for a long time. It's super informative and demonstrates a variety of wools. Who agrees? Oh, Jude, you're very sweet. Thank you. I'm glad you found it helpful because I was questioning doing this, this, uh, this one, but... It, it's really relaxing for me to do simple projects like this and sometimes maybe we all just need a little art therapy it's kind of soothing to do something simple um, trees happy little tree color of tree oh this tree I am using for the stalk I use dark chocolate the stalk for the <laughs> trunk I use dark chocolate and for the um, boughs I just used spruce and bonsai which are both really nice dark greens and they kind of fill in things well. I'm really tempted now, I, the one thing I want to do is go back and add more of these little um, Tassa silk flowers. I really liked just wadding it up like that. I wished I had brought more colors, but why don't we look at that and let's pause here. This whole thing needs, um, needs some love and by that I mean it needs stuff to be tacked down. There's little bits of vegetable matter in here. We call it VM. For those of you who are new to felting, it's no big deal. It's just hay and sheepy stuff. And um, you just pick it out when it's on the surface layer and don't worry about it when it's underneath. So we need a doorknob real quick. Anyone tell me what else? I know I've missed a few things. I've not trimmed out that little window there. I bet your uh, mind can envision that. I'm going to just drop in a dark gray doorknob and then you can add a little, um, let's see, storm over the top if you want it to look like it has a little bit of shine to it or you want that to look like it's just the shadow. You can basically like lay the shadow down first and then put your doorknob on top. And I will go around and needle felt all of these. And I want to drop in, I want to bring you up close to this Tessa Silk Flower because it has just become my favorite little knotted mess, even if the color isn't perfect. So I want to make another one of those with you, even though I spent most of my, here's my, so here it is. This is the little Tessa Silk. And let's go in and nod, not, not, I'm trying to say not up another one of those. I'm going to put it right over this white, which I didn't like. I used cotton white on my picture last night. Uh, so here's what I did. I just take this up. Let's just kind of wad it up into a little mess. And I'm going to plunk it right there. And then needle felt it in and twirl it. And just let it be a little bit knotted. And these actually, in person, you can see that they have a lot of sheen. So often you'll like to do things in like threes and fives um, so that it feels balanced. So, But, you know, you can change the size too and not make them all really large. I'm going to put one right on top of that. And this is my slightly finer needle because it's a little bit smaller. <clears throat> 
so I need to fill those in and add more but I think that that little I think those have some interesting sheen that these don't and now I'm gonna be looking at doing more Tessa silk and I like this little sorry silk waist inclusion right over here and the locks so maybe all we need is a sheep on the roof he'd be at a maybe a goat if he's gonna be <laughs> at that angle <laughs> he'd be kind of at a at a funny angle but you can also put something back over here or you can just drop a few clouds in the sky and they don't have to be specific <clears throat> they can be just a suggestion of a cloud one can be just coming right out of your frame there and tack them down without much regard and then you won't overthink it. You can make perfectly formed clouds if you want, but you can also just put some uh, wisps in the sky. And I think we're gonna call this little guy done, but I'm gonna look for your suggestions of what to add. I will finish this and I'm sure they could use a little door or something, but I'm gonna look for your suggestions of what you would like to see added to our little Hobbit house scene. So let's see if there are just a few more. I'd like to see if there are any final comments before we part, and uh, before we part, we're gonna give away prizes. So let me see uh, what you all have to say. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you like the flowers. Uh, oh, a uh, flowers pop, uh, a goat. Oh, a chimney. You know, there do need to be chimneys. One of the things that I found enchanting was as you looked across the hillside, you could see like in the grass, little chimneys sticking up. So it was actually really cool. Okay, so I'm gonna add a chimney, but I'll add it uh, at another time. I've lost my shoe. <laughs> take my shoes off oh I'm so glad you all like it thank you so much for your feedback and I can't wait to see yours so shutters to the windows that seems like a cute idea um, when can we move in let's go let's go in right now let's eat that bread and cheese and um, and what did we say uh, like cold cold squash soup a pail on its side oh I can't wait so I hope that you all add some really fun details now um, let me tell you, before we give away prizes, I want to share with you, so maybe we'll all be watching The Hobbit over the next couple of days, and um, or the trilogy, but I started with The Hobbit, and what we all know is that The Hobbit is all about going to get that dragon, or reclaim the treasure underneath the hill from the dragon. So I thought today was a perfect time to remind you all, or tease out the, what's coming, and that is our online felting school. Our online felting school will launch this summer, I promise. The team is working behind the scenes diligently to make it all that it can be, and this is going to bring you world-class classes with world-class teachers that are gems of people sharing their favorite projects with you one-on-one, -on -one, all filmed right here in the Living Felt Studios. So this is one that to me is just amazing and was so fun. And this dragon was made by Joyce Hazelrig right here in the studio. And he's made with Living Felt MC1 batting and Merino top and a lot of the supplies that we use together. Uh, and we will have a kit for this dragon. Now, you can make your dragon in any color. We'll also be sharing an amazing red one that she made, um, blue ones uh, she's made. And students in our class make a variety of colors. So the color is up to you. But this is going to be an online class. It is a paid class, but I know a lot of you have a challenge you know, coming to the in-person workshops, and this one, Joyce, takes you through every step of making your dragon. So the dragons have posable wings, which I think is just fantastic, and um, awesome tails. You're going to hand make the horns and the claws and everything. And one of the teachers in the school also teaches how to make the eyes. So we have some great classes and Here They Be Dragons by Joyce Hazelrig is one. This is completely, you know, she has really worked this out and she worked very I want to say lovingly on this class and on this dragon. So I feel blessed to be able to see her dragons in person and thank you Joyce for allowing us to host your class. So the classes are going to be online and on demand and that means that you, once you sign up for the class, it's yours to attend at your own pace. They are filmed really up close and personal so that you see all of the steps and they're broken down into step by step by step so that you can go back and review a really finite 
finite section. You know, you don't have to scroll through three hours of video to find the section that you're wanting. Uh, the teachers often provide some kind of reference materials and definitely a supply list once you're enrolled in the class. And yeah, hours of hours of video to just fall in love with. And what else? Um, and that, I guess that it's streaming, so you don't have to download it to your system. You'll be able to stream it from your tablet or PDF. Now, um, so if you want to know how to take this class, you need to do a couple things. One is subscribe to our channel here on YouTube and if you've had fun today well hopefully you'll give us a thumbs up on the video. Um, join our email list. So go to livingfelt.com join our email list. Scroll to the bottom and it says get newsletter. You want to make sure you're on our email list because you guys are going to get first notice of the classes when we open enrollment and um, you can also follow us on Facebook. That's a great way. We hang out on Facebook and Living Felt Friends. Our BFFs always get first notice. So the group, I'll tell you honestly, always gets first notice. So join the group and then if you felt with us, well then tag us on Instagram. But um, that's where you're going to want to follow us so that you get notified when the school opens, which will be early this summer. But not only do we, are we doing needle felting things, we have wet felted hats by Don Edwards. We have wet felted wearables by uh, Charity Vandermeer as well as Diana Nagorna. We have um, some other delicious classes including the landscape by uh, Anna Repke that, that's the a sunset landscape on the water so there's some really great classes lined up make sure again that you join our email list go to our page and join follow get the newsletter and that way you'll get first notice when the school opens but I wanted to show you this dragon because you're going to want to put that on your bucket list of classes to take I promise it's going to be amazing okay so yes it sounds incredible <laughs> I think that you guys yes there will be a kit for the class and so you just have to pick your color or we'll give you a complete supply list and you can just a la carte that completely as as you want um, so and yeah oh and Kate Kaprowski does a really special mushroom hat also so I would just want you to know that we are very excited to bring the school to you thank you for staying tuned this long and staying staying I know that it's been a long time coming uh, but this is what we made today together and I just thank you all so much here's the little one that we did I'll work on keep adding something to it I can't wait to see yours share them in our group uh, living felt friends and the last thing I want to do before we go is share with you just a quick little slideshow of some of the things our friends have made and then we're going to give away prizes so here's a quick play from just some things shared in the group this week that's Shelly Schwartz it's an eight inch needle felted bear made to look like a vintage bear check out Teresa Dudick did our project last week way better than mine oh where'd the play this go oh I'm sorry let's go back to that All right, I was in the middle of it okay this is Abby Oscarson amazing Candy McBride did our waffle bird check out that steampunk he's amazing this is Diana Godzowska wow she's pretty new to portraits Edel Litland love that 2d fantastic Air Enid Lecky did that from our um, artful felt fabric that's Jamie Weisbrod look how happy they are on their virtual vacay. Lucky Lowe, check out this um, embroidery. It's ribbon embroidery also on her felt fabric and a completely different bear. This is Nissa Brunk. Love this guy. He's just so cute. Great Mixed Media by Ruth Stevens there. And then we are back to the bear. So I just wanted to share a few projects that our friends post. There are tons and tons of posts every day in Living Felt Friends. So um, we hope that you'll join us there. Now for next week, I'm going to be doing a project with the Arfo felt fabric but a little less blingy so I'm going to be sharing that but this is a, an example of fabric that you might make wet felt for next time if you're not sure what that is look on our YouTube for the Arfo felt fabric we made a very rich wet felt fabric um, and you can use your very rich felt fabric but you might also want to have some that are just maybe some of your favorite color blocks without a whole bunch of texture on it and I have some fun projects to share with you with that so that you can go big or large and you can make lots of things with so check out our video for wet felting and artful felt fabric under our wet felting tutorials and that will prepare you for playing with me next week and having a little bit of fun so thank you all so much for playing with me I know it's been a long session it's 3 30 look what I have here and hat full of little bitty names 
We're going to give away some prizes for everyone who's participated in the live feed. And if your name doesn't get drawn or I didn't answer your questions, well then leave a comment down below. And if you had fun, we hope you give us a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. So let me tell you what our prizes are today. We are going to give away an MC1 goodie bag, which is 12 delicious colors of our MC1. And if you have a preference, you can let us know. We have a winter goodie, the standard goodie, which is generally just a great breadth of colors. And then we also have a fall goodie, which we used in our fantasy owls. You're also going to get a color of 100% wool felt. Today we used a half a sheet. We've been using half a sheet for our postcards. And we're also going to send you my beloved 42 triangle felting needles. So our two winners, I pulled them out of the hat just now while we're standing here. We have Kat Trockelman. Congratulations, Kat. And we have Bonnie Shockey. Congratulations, gals. Bonnie and Kat, thank you so much for playing. And everyone, just thank you so much for spending this time with me. You really brightened my day today, and as did all the fairies and my beautiful husband and life. Appreciate you so much. Y'all take good, good care of yourself. Go felt something. Do anything that makes your heart happy today, because gosh darn it, you deserve it. We appreciate you. Thank you so much, y'all. Bye.